when we come to the time of Advent, the tradition is that every Sunday, a different candle is lit. On the first week, we light one. The next week, we light the one that we're lighting now, as well as the one for the next week, building up to the time of Christmas when we light the Christ candle to signify that Christ is the light of the world. This is one of the ways, you must remember, we've only, we've only been a literate society for a couple of hundred years. In the sense that the average person only had the ability to read for himself, to purchase a Bible for himself in his language the last 300, 400 years. Before that, people had to make do with symbols, with stained glass windows, with the story of the gospel being told through play, through song, through oral tradition, and through signs like the Advent wreath to remind us of what time we're in and what we are building towards. So keep an eye on the candles. Keep an eye on the color as well. Purple, which is the royal color, but also purple to remind us that this is a time of preparation. Not preparation for Christmas, but preparation for the return of Christ himself. So with that as a backdrop, let's have a look at our reading uh, one more time just to make sure we get what Jesus is trying to say. Matthew 24, so right at the end of his gospel, his last real teaching for his disciples before his arrest. So there's a sense in which Jesus is urgent about what he's teaching and he wants them to understand how urgent he is. So just before this, they're walking through Jerusalem and these bunch of disciples whom we know weren't the most educated and well-traveled guys in the whole of Judea, they're walking through Jerusalem and they say to Jesus, Lord, look at the splendor and the size of this temple. These stones, incredible. This craftsmanship, majestic. Jesus says, I tell you this, I will break down and build up this temple in three days. Majestic stones and all. And that starts this train of thought. The disciples say, when? When will you break this down? And Jesus says this, about the day and the hour, no one knows. Not the angels, not even the Son, only the Father. Let that be a final reminder and lesson for all those who would fill our ears with false prophecies about the end of the world. No one knows. And you must be careful of those who think they do. Keep in mind, verse 36, about that day and hour no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. And now read the last, second last verse. Understand this. If the owner of the house had known he would, not, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Those two verses can sandwich what we're trying to say here. Jesus is saying, no one knows. Because if the enemy knows, he will make plans against the second coming. Does that make sense? If we sandwich the reading that way. So this is need-to-know basis. And Jesus says, and you don't need to know. Because if you do, the enemy might hear. And if the enemy hears, this whole plan might take longer to come to its end. So that last verse sometimes causes us a bit of, a bit of trouble. We don't know how to understand it. But I think it's responsible to say what Jesus is saying is, the owner of this world, the prince of darkness as John calls him, needs to be as unaware of the coming of Christ as the rest of us, for our sakes. Does that make sense? Good, so we can leave that verse out of the rest of the reading and we can move on to what Jesus says in the middle. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the days of the Son of Man. In those days before the flood, they were eating, 
Yeah. Drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, nothing strange about that. Until the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Two will be in the field, one will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together, one will be taken, one will be left. This is a reference probably to something the Romans used to do. When the Roman army stormed or marched through a town or a village and your sons were working in the field, they'd say, we'll have the one and you can keep the other. One will be taken, one will be left. Two sisters will be pounding meal together. The Romans will say, we'll have the one, you keep the other. One will be taken, one will be left. Interesting here, Jesus is not giving us any clue as to whether it's actually better to be taken or to be left behind. This is not a passage about the rapture. This is a passage about just how unprepared the world will be. But you are not of the world, are you? You are in the world and you live with the certain knowledge and expectation that Christ may return at any moment. How would your life be different? How would your, how would your daily life, your day-to-day -day habits, how would they be different if you expected Christ to return now? this very moment. You would have no inkling. You would have no warning. No trumpet sounding. No animals acting strange. No earthquakes. No famine. No war could give you any indication when he might return. It might be on the most gloriously joyous day of your life, say the birth of a grandchild. How would your life be different if you truly expected Christ to return this very moment. What would you stop doing? Perhaps more importantly, what would you start doing? That's the energy behind this passage. The energy, the passion of Christ that gives this passage its meaning is supposed to make us sit up a little bit straighter and reconsider just how close all things are to their end. And if not all things, then at least you and I. Because for all our wisdom, and for all our knowledge, and for all our cleverness, we cannot add a single minute to our own lives. We cannot even determine the day, or the hour, or the year, or the circumstances of our own demise. And if we cannot do that, why concern ourselves with the return of Christ? There's an important context, con concept, my mistake, that sits below this passage that I think will make a good introduction to the time of Advent that we can keep exploring together. So um, what we're about to talk about, perhaps keep that in mind as we move towards Christmas. We live in the meantime. We live as people who are no longer slaves to sin, as St. Paul says, who are no longer caught in the darkness. Thank God. But we also live as people who are not yet where God wants us. So we have these two worlds. The no longer, the world that has been changed by the death and resurrection of Christ. And the not yet, the world that is still moving towards that second coming. And you and I are in that middle time, that middle passage, what we might call the meantime. And I heard a preacher from America say this week, the, mean, 
the mean time are mean times living in the meantime means you're living in mean times warfare famine pandemic but that's where we are and more importantly perhaps that's where God wants us to be and that is what God is preparing us for this this peace here in the middle that's the twilight that's the breaking through of the day out of the night that is us by the grace of God beginning to discern the shapes and the silhouettes of the true world around us more importantly that is what Advent is about Advent is about saying remember that if you belong to God you are no longer of the world and you are not yet in the kingdom all things are still moving towards their end does that make sense so if I said to you if I framed the question the question differently if I said to you you are no longer under the bondage of sin and you are not yet in paradise with Christ how would your life be different what would you do differently how would you order your priorities differently what would you worship how would you worship and who would you worship think back to that reading from Isaiah Isaiah gives us this incredible vision he says in the coming days and when he says in the coming days he means those days of Christ's return when all things come to their end in the coming days all people all nations Russians and Ukrainians Tunisians and Australians will go up to the one mountain to offer the one right worship to the one true God what does your worship look like and what and who do you worship if this is true for you if you are here in the middle times we can put it a little bit differently we can say that there's one understanding of time chronos which is where we get chronological time that's the time on our watches on our calendars that is time that moves in a linear fashion since we started recording it up until the end of all, th of all things we know whether July 15th next year will be a Saturday or a Sunday we know that Christmas this year will be on a Sunday morning we know these things or is it a Saturday I'm not sure but 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 you know these things <laughs> and when we forget we can look at our calendars because chronos chronological time is predictable it moves by the second by the minutes by the hour by the day by the week by the month by the year by the decade in a very predictable fashion but we are not of chronos time we are of kairos time and so when Paul writes and when Jesus writes about the hour of the coming of the Son of Man the word he uses for hour for time is not chronos it's kairos and kairos doesn't obey the laws of the clock kairos doesn't move in a linear fashion and more importantly kairos is not predictable it doesn't come when you expect or plan it God like a lightning bolt from the sky inflicts his kairos in the world around us to show us that his timing and his time is different and again as with the previous slide of no longer and not yet you and I are caught in the middle because whether we I could or not church starts at 9 30 on a Sunday but God will return when he returns and every prophet and preacher who tries to convince you that they can determine the hour and the day 
you can take back to Matthew 24 verse 36 and you can say there's a Kairos time that belongs to God that you and I have no control over. This is Advent. Advent is saying to each other we live in this Kairos time because God is in control of our lives. There's one more way we can break it down. We can say that the world we are currently living in is the night, it's the darkness, it's the one in which we find the world asleep. Now sleep, sleep in the Bible is a, is a strange thing because it has a spiritual meaning and it's never positive. When the Bible talks about sleep, it's almost always in the negative because it's referring to people being spiritually asleep. So yes, they're awake and they're walking around and they're doing things, but they are not awoken to the reality of God's new world. Paul says, this is the world. It's darkness. It's nighttime. It's people who are asleep. Jesus says, it's like in the days of Noah. People go about their days doing all the right things, eating and drinking and marrying, giving in marriage, farming, business, commerce, everything else. But up until the day that the flood came, they had no inclination of what was going on because they were asleep. And Jesus says in his own time, in Matthew's time, it is quite the same. People are going through the motions, doing all the things they are supposed to do. Maybe even coming to church. But if you are asleep, then you will not see that breaking through of the light, that breaking through of the dawn. You will not begin to discern the world around you for what it truly is. And so while the world around us is night, you and I have been called to the day to live in the light and more importantly, to wake up, to keep watch, to take heart. And we're not there yet. We're here in the middle. There is a day coming declares the Lord, when all things will be wrapped in a light that leaves no shadow. There will be nowhere for the darkness to hide. And we're not there yet. But we must try and live in that light now. Otherwise, to use a modern image, we might find ourselves walking around in broad daylight still wearing our pajamas. There's one more thing that, 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 that sits at the heart of everything we've read. That passage about from Isaiah about going up to God's mountain to worship. That passage from Romans which says very clearly to walk in the light, to live your life awake is to stop your licentiousness and your stubbornness and your quarreling and your jealousy and your drunkenness. But there's one more thing that sits below that. And that is the hope. The hope we have that things have to change. That God promises change. That the world you and I inhabit now is not the way things will always be. You see, to be a Christian, to be a disciple of Christ, has always meant that if someone were to ask you honestly whether you think the world is in a good place, you would say, no, it is not. Yes, we might be solving problems of medicine and poverty and hunger in real time. But one person who suffers and struggles and pains and hurts is one person too much in the kingdom of God. There is a world coming 
in which no one will know pain, hunger, suffering, loneliness, anxiety, panic, and fear. And if we walk around and see even one person who is still suffering under the yoke of the world, of this no longer world, it is our duty to say this is not the way things should be. What is, is not what should be. The way things are, are not the way God intends them. And they are moving toward their end. In the Catholic tradition, you're, you're familiar with the seven deadly sins? Well, even if you can't name them, I'm sure you know them. Um, in the Catholic tradition, of the seven deadly sins, pride is considered the most dangerous. Pride is the one that undergirds all the others. Pride is the one that leads you into lust and into gluttony and into anger because pride makes you think that you're more important than you are. But there's a good reformed theologian um, in the early, early 20th century, Karl Barth, who said, the time in which pride was the cardinal sin is past. The cardinal sin now in this world for you and I is sloth, laziness. Put another way, sleepiness. The idea that you can remain sleepwalking through the world when all things are in fact changing all the time. The idea that you and I can simply accept the world as it is and let go of our responsibility to tell the world, no, this is not as it should be. Advent calls us, in the words of Christ himself, to keep watch. Let's go back to that final, final verse that he mentions. Verse 42, keep awake. You do not know on what hour the Lord is coming. Verse 44, therefore be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. There may not be time for you to fix the things you think are wrong in the world. You must try to fix them now. If you need to hear the following message, then you must hear it clearly. There may not be time for you to get right with God later. You have to do it now. Because you don't know, and I don't know, and the angels don't know when Christ returns. But when He does, He will look harshly upon those who are asleep while he will welcome those who are awake to his side. Let's end there. Uh, well, let's end today's message there, but let's keep it in mind as we move through Advent. Advent not as a celebration or preparation for Christmas. Advent as a preparation of our own hearts with the sure reality that Christ may return at any moment. To do that, we're going to listen to a piece of music, a piece of uh, Taizé music. Wait for the Lord, whose day is near. Wait for the Lord, keep watch, take heart. And we'll do that as our final prayer together.